to share with you some of my thoughts and experiences around the value of what crisis teaches you in life, uh, the important lessons of crisis and the clues that one has found and I have found in, uh, in, in the crisis that I have gone through in my life. And, and the hope is not to sort of, you know, talk about, you know, the dramatic part of it, but the hope is that, that you would get some nuggets out of it that uh, will hopefully prevent you from, you know, going through such crisis and, and then discovering some of the magic that I've found in life. So um, just as a quick um, uh, background about my journey, even though I was born, you know, in the 60s, in the mid-60s to be precise, my journey actually started uh, somewhere around when I was 17 years of age in India, growing up in India. So, um, you know, I wanted to share with you, I want to start off by sharing a story with you, a story of uh, an experience that literally transformed my life, a story that has an experience that has shaped me since I was 17 years old. This is, uh, you know, rewind all the way back to 1982. I was all of 17 years of age. And I had uh, a near-death experience. And uh, it was actually a very unfortunate one in that I lost one of my friends. Uh, a friend uh, who, you know, I literally grew up with. Only son, five daughters. And um, it's one that really sort of, you know, I, I like to say that I learned about life by coming close to death and experiencing death, not in a morbid way, but in terms of how mysterious and how fragile life is. What you see up on the screen there is actually a picture of a lake. In fact, it's the very lake that this incident happened uh, back in India. Uh, this is right before I was going to start my undergraduate degree. My friends and I, with my sister and her friends, went out to this um, little lake outside of my town called Hyderabad. And uh, if you notice the rocks, if you look at the rocks closely, you see watermarks on that rock. And uh, what we didn't know when we went out to that particular picnic was that that lake actually was not a, you know, a level water lake. It used to rise and fall uh, with, with the monsoons. And it had so happened that uh, the summer before was a pretty dry year, so people had dug up wells. And uh, then the rain had come in, and it covered up those wells. And uh, all of us, you know, all of 17 years of age, as we were in the lake, you know, playing around, fooling around, in about 10 feet ahead of me, I see this friend of mine who I knew couldn't swim, just walked right in, and I could see him go straight down like a rock. Okay, and I had no idea what was going on. I jumped right after him and tried to save him, and as I was doing it, he was coming up for air, and he grabbed me around my stomach and squeezed me so hard that I opened up my mouth and I started taking in water. So we went up and down a couple of times, and it was about the final time. Apparently, you do that thrice, and then the third time away, you get pulled away for good. Friends of mine saw that. They came and they pulled me by my hair, and uh, unfortunately, they couldn't save him. Again, all of 17 years of age, and it's, you know, I was in the ICU for two days, and um, hysterical, as you can imagine, because suddenly you realize, you know, you know, someone that you grew up with is no longer there, and suddenly you realize that life can just go away. And the hardest part for me was asking the question, why? Why is it that I was saved, and why is it that he had to give his life, and how does life work? And, you know, I had, I had a choice at that time to make. My choice was to sort of take that pain and kind of get buried underneath it, or my choice was to start looking at the fragility and the mystery of life and start saying, okay, what do I learn from it? How do I put the rest of the time I have to work? And, and that has been some of the things that have kind of guided me. And essentially what it has done is it has started me sort of on this path of shifting my mental model of making everyday matters, in a, not in a trite and a cliched manner, but understanding that what you've got today, there's no certainty about it tomorrow. So how do I you know, make sure that not knowing what's happening in the future make every one of these days matter? And what I have seen over the last uh, literally 30 years since that accident is I've kind of gone through four shifts in my life. And, and these are somewhat... Uh, you know, in sequential order. And, and these are not just, this is not just about, you know, in a negative, morbid way. A lot of this is also about the mysteriousness of life. What I've found is life gives you these little clues as you go along. And, and if you pay attention to it, you don't have to wait for a crisis to listen to those clues in order to be able to change and transform yourself. And so let me share with you a few of these things, and we'll talk about the fun stuff with Watson, and in fact, how Watson connects to a crisis that I'm going through in my life, and, and why I believe Watson is one of the most meaningful things I have done in my life. So the first shift that I kind of went through uh, 
was this whole shift from paranoia to passion, okay? Uh, immediately after that accident, the, I, I, was, I mean, I couldn't even drink a glass of water. When I used to lift up that water and I see that sh uh, water shaking, it used to bring me right back to that event. And there were days that I could not overcome that whole fear of water. And two months after this thing, I, I, I go out to uh, a place called Bits Pilani. I go out to my undergraduate. And, and I couldn't socially fit in because I was mentally so messed up. One of the things I decided is I was not going to live my life in fear of this thing that had you know, gripped my life for the last three months. And I remember at 6 PM one evening, there was a small swimming pool we had that had closed at 5 o'clock. I jumped the wall got onto that swimming pool, and I forced myself to jump into the swimming pool, go at the deep end of it, and sit down cross-legged, and open my eyes, and stare at the water, and talking to myself that you are not going to control my life, okay? And, and it, was this, it was a simple act, but it was a very important act where when I say my journey, my birth, in essence, that was when I really started taking steps in my life to say, you know what, I'm not going to live in fear. I am going to start looking at the beauty and the magic of what life has to offer, knowing that nothing is known for tomorrow. I'm going to make this day matter. And, and I see that every part. You know, uh, Diane talked about my passion for racing. For the last uh, seven years, uh, I've really sort of taken on and, and have been working on my professional racing license, which I'll lose this year because of Watson. I, you know, I don't get to race anymore. Uh, good, good sacrifice. But, um, the picture you see there is, 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 is of a racetrack, a Formula One racetrack in Istanbul. It's turn one on Istanbul. And it's one of the most notorious turns in Formula One racing where a lot of accidents happen, a lot of injuries happen. And at the same time, it's that one turn that determines winners from losers. If you don't approach that turn with the confidence, with the passion that I know what I'm doing, I can get through it, that's the turn that sort of, you know, uh, has seen a lot of races won and lost, a lot of people sort of make through it or not. And what I've found in life is that if you approach something with passion, if you approach something with a larger goal, and I love the words you used, uh, Doug, about you know, designing for empathy or designing for meaning. If you approach something that has a meaning that's bigger than you, it's bigger than your little life and your bank balance, and if you have a passion there, you can actually go out and, 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 and barriers somehow sort of just, just get out in front of you. And, and this is one of the big shifts that I've seen, uh, even in the two startups that I did. Every one of these, when you approach it with passion and conviction, some of these barriers start going. The second shift I went through was going, shifting my mental model from being reactive to proactive. Okay? Reactive in the sense that you know, most of the time in my life, I was waiting for things to happen to me. Okay, I'll get my graduate degree, then I get interviewed, and then I'm going to get a job, and, 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 and so on and so forth. One of the things I decided, along with the shift, was you know, this notion of manifestation, if you start visualizing, if you start imagining a certain world for yourself, and if you have the courage to fail, you know, everyone has the desire to succeed, but very few people have the courage to fail. If you really accept the notion of it's okay for me to fail and go after it, then some incredible things happen. And, and one of the things to me, you know, uh, so fast forward, finished my school, came to the US, got a job at 3M, seven years into a job with 3M, eight promotions, doing quite well. And this is 1998, and uh, I see Mosaic come out. Mosaic, the browser, some of you may remember that. And I started imagining you know, the possibilities with a technology like that. And one of the things I had to do was I started imagining a world where computers are connected through this browser technology, and companies are connected through it, and a whole lot of, this is again back in 1998. So one of the things I had to do was to shift the mindset from being comfortable making $150,000 a year in 1998 to then quitting my job, taking $200,000 and 13 credit cards, convincing my wife that it's OK, you know, because if it goes under, we'll have to move to a condo for three and a half years. I made an Excel sheet for her uh, saying, <laughs> you know, I, I call her my first venture capitalist because you know, she went for that crazy idea. And, 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 and the whole thing was based on one thing alone. It was around what I saw were the possibilities around what this internet could bring about. And also, it was about the time my second daughter was born. And watching and seeing that the next generation is here, and there was another reminder that the time that I've got left, the runway is kind of getting shorter. So that was the second shift I went through. And the third one was this notion of from just from doing to living. Okay? Every day you get up, every day you go to work, every day you go out and you know, put in your 10, 8, 10, 12 hours, you know, whatever you do, 
One of the things I realized is it is not just when I saw the careers at 3M, okay, it's a great company, an American icon, but what happens there is you are given more and more responsibilities as you go up in your career, and then suddenly one day either the company decides you're not right for it, or you know, the, the job changes and then you're out. And when you're out there, I've seen a lot of senior executives with no purpose and meaning and no identity, literally, because they were busy doing. They were not busy living. You know, so not having an object or a title define your life, and, and, and not just kind of, I, I, I use the term confusing motion for movement, is the second insight, sort of, and the third one that I took in, and I said, I'm going to start living my life, and I'm going to start experiencing things just beyond building companies. So one of the shifts I had to do after I built and uh, sold my two startups, the third obvious thing to do was to obviously go and do another one. They were private equity companies offering hundreds of millions of dollars to go start another company. And my point was, instead of continuing to go in this direction, I'd rather go out and explore new things. I'd rather go get a racing license. I'd rather go you know, explore the world. I'd rather go see my daughters sort of uh, you know, grow and, and not be on planes all the time. So that was sort of the third shift I went through. And then the fourth one, probably the most important one, and the one that I'm going through right now, is the shift I call from following to discovering. Okay. One of the things, and, and, and again, as an immigrant, the story is even more relevant, because when you come into the US, the first objective is, it's a new country, you gotta get yourself financial stability, you gotta provide for your family, and, and there's a lot of pressure, because I knew people back in India were thinking I was, and I was an idiot for, for leaving 3M, taking this, I didn't tell them I took the credit cards and all that loan, but, but there's that pressure that you put on yourself because there is this path that you're supposed to follow. You go out, you get your degree, you go out to a large company, you get a nice little house and a dog, and, and then you sail away into the sunset. Uh, to me, the choice here I had to make was more about not doing the same thing, not going and doing a third startup, but trying to really figure out what are the new paths. And, and lo and behold, one of the things that happened to me three years ago, um, I was deciding you know, after I got acquired by IBM whether to stay on every year or you know, go out and do something else in life. And about that time, a mother, and this is the crisis that I'm dealing with right now, uh, she's 74 years old, uh, she's been a retired doctor, uh, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. Okay? She's been a pillar in my life all along, and th from three years, since three years I've seen her sort of wither away, I, I, I talk to her and, and I see this strong person sort of walking away into the fog and I've done a tremendous amount of research to understand what causes this Alzheimer's, what causes these mental diseases. There's nothing that's known about it. I mean, it's amazing for a country like us in a day and age like today, we know so little about mental disease, we know so little about cancer, and it's about that time, about a year ago, um, IBM then announced this uh, game show called Jeopardy, and uh, many of you saw us come up with this innovation called IBM Watson, which beat the, you know, the Jeopardy playing uh, computers. And then, given my track record and my background, uh, you know, the CEO of IBM and the team came up to me and said, you know, we think someone like you with the background and track record that you have would be the right person to, to, to run Watson. To me, the most important thing about Watson was not just the technology, the cool technology, the new class of computing and everything else. To me, it was an opportunity at a personal level to start addressing this crisis I'm in my life right now, which is helping understand how can machines start addressing some of these issues of knowledge gaps. So I, I talk about this notion of Watson and me. I mean, there's a ton of stuff about how Watson worked, the technology and the cool stuff, and I'm not gonna go into it as much. But I'm gonna talk about the meaning, again, building back on what Doug said, or what Watson means to me. Watson, to me, is an amazing tool and a capability to start addressing things that connect to it at the most personal level. And, and the first area we're applying it to is healthcare. Okay? And in healthcare, uh, some of you may know the stats, but medical, medical knowledge is doubling every five years. And doctors tell us that they're spending less than five hours a day, uh, five hours a month, reading up. So my, my whole dynamic when I walk into a clinic has changed now. I'm like, I'm like that little kid shivering in, wondering whether, you know, what's gonna happen to me, whether this person knows anything about my disease or not. And uh, so we figured this would be a great area to start applying um, you know, Watson, because here's the thing, one out of five diagnoses in the US is considered to be incomplete or inaccurate. Up to 92,000 people a year die in the United States because of inaccurate diagnosis. And then we started looking at saying, okay, what are the diseases here that something like this would make a big difference? And we found that cancer was a big one, okay? 
up to 44% of initial cancer diagnosis are reversed, okay? And one out of three people that we know in our lives will contract cancer sometime in their lives, okay? So initially I was thinking mental health, mental diseases, but then we started studying this domain, we found out that there is a tremendous amount of issues that we have in this country today where knowledge on one hand is doubling. I, I use the analogy of, you know, we are dying of thirst in an ocean of salt water, right? There's data all around, but there is no technology or no ability for us to process that. So Watson to me personally, it's not just about getting a cool technology, we will do that and building new apps, but it's also about addressing and, and listening to this clue that life has given me saying, with watching my mother sort of wither away in front of me to say, how can I use a technology like this so that someone else's mother, someone else's sister, someone else's daughter doesn't have to go through what I'm going through. And I remember the first time, and this, this kind of shakes me up even now, that I went to MD Anderson in Houston to talk about a potential partnership because they have all the knowledge that I wanted to put into Watson. And I had seven other IBMers with me walking off of the parking ramp. The first thing I see is this 12-year-old kid with no hair, in a wheelchair, just coming out of a chemotherapy session, and the parents pushing the chair, right? I paused there, and I turned to my team, and I said, just take a look at the picture and remember that. He says, there are times when you think I push you guys too hard, when you, when you tell, when you think I'm being unreasonable, remember that's what we are working for, okay? That's the kind of problem we're trying to solve. And, and I believe with a technology like Watson, with a company like IBM, and a country like the United States, we are at the right place and right time to be able to take on uh, some, so, so, so big and so significant a challenge. So, um, you know, I just want to kind of wrap up with this saying, you know, to me, again, it's not about success or failure. To me, it's about the journey and the quality of the journey. And there is this quote that I came across, which to me really encapsulates everything that I've been doing over the last 30 years and hopefully worked since that event and what I anticipate doing later, which is success is never final and failure is never fatal. Many often, you know, many of us often in life hold ourselves back because we are, we are afraid that this failure is going to kill us. There is no such failure that will ever kill you. There's no such success that's ultimate, and, and that's been one of my biggest insights as I've gone, you know, from learning from the, both the crises and the clues that I've seen in life. I want to again thank you for your time today and uh, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.